Next up, we have uh, joining us on Zoom, Miguel Hernan, who is a professor at Harvard Epi. Uh, he's director of the Causal Lab, and he'll tell us more about causal inference. Hello. Can you see the screen? Great. Thank you very much. So uh, I, I'm going to talk about what learning from data mean. It is a very, I think, fitting topic for for this for this conference. So um, let's just start by looking at the definition that we have of these things in Wikipedia. What is artificial intelligence in healthcare? And what we see there is this. The use of machine learning algorithms and software or artificial intelligence, they seem to be the same thing, to mimic human cognition in the analysis, presentation, and comprehension of a complex medical care healthcare data. Well, does something like that exist? No. Uh, uh, if, if that is the definition of artificial intelligence in healthcare, I'm going to claim that we don't have that. It is artificial, yes, but it's not intelligence yet. On, on a more positive note, we have lots of data, we have very good algorithms, and we have powerful computers. So we should be able to do something with that, whether it is truly intelligence or not. Um, and speci specifically, we should be able to, to use those algorithms in, on those computers to learn something from the databases. Now, what we can actually learn from data? The, see, the, 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 oh, sorry. People typically say that they are, what they are doing is to gain insights from data or, or extracting meaning from data. Those definitions are too vague. Think about the types of data, about the types of subject matter knowledge and about the uh, analytics that we need. Uh, we better know what type of insights we are after. And it turns out, I'm going to claim that there are only three things that we can do with data. Uh, and that means there are only three types of data, three types of domain knowledge, and three types of analytics that we know. And in this paper, we, we describe these tasks, uh, these three tasks uh, that I'm going to briefly summarize for you. The first task, the first thing that we can do with data is to provide a quantitative summary of features, and that's description. The second thing that we can do with data is to map some features, uh, let's call them inputs, into other features, let's call them outputs. And that comes by different names, that type of mapping. The third thing that we can do is to use the data to predict features of the world if the world had been different. And that's what uh, we refer to as counterfactual prediction. So this third task is the one that takes care of answering what if questions. Causal inference is the contrast of two counterfactual predictions. So let's let's keep this um, this taxonomy in mind because we are going to be using it during this talk, and I hope in the discussion later. So let me let me give you some examples of tasks. Uh, first, if if we are talking about description, well, we can use the data to compute the proportion of people with diabetes or represented social networks in a community. And to do that, we can do some very simple things. Sometimes we just need to compute an average. Sometimes we use unsupervised learning algorithms like cluster analysis. Sometimes we use very clever data, database. If we're talking about our, our second task, which is prediction, but we want to map input to outputs, or also known as pattern recognition, uh, we can do this in, 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 in very simple settings. Uh, we, we, just, we just compute what is the strength of the association between low albumin and death, say. Or we can do more complex things like classify patients by their risk of death according to hundreds of clinical measurements. Or we can use it for natural language processing to mapping medical notes to data that we can actually analyze. And again, there, there, there is a range of analytics that we can use here from a 
correlation coefficient to deep learning. Very different analytics, but for the same task, mapping inputs to outputs. The third task is counterfactual prediction. This one example of this is if we want to know what the mortality rate would be if everyone in the population had been screened for cancer versus if they had not. And there are different type of analytics here. If we are or if, if we are making this inference using a randomized trial, it may be just an elementary calculation. If we are using observational data, we may need to use some reinforcement learning with some mathematical modeling. If we are using more complex observational data, we may be working with G with G methods that can deal with treatment component feedback, like Robin's G program. But what is important, the science is defined, is defined by its its goals, not by the tools that that um, that science uses. So we don't define astrophysics as the discipline that learns. We define astrophysics as the discipline that learns the the, the composition of the of the stars, not as the discipline that uses the spectroscope. So we probably shouldn't define data science or machine learning as the discipline that uses deep learning or whatever the the algorithm is. But as the as the as the science that uses data for description, prediction, and counterfactual prediction. Now, tech companies have done a lot of um, machine learning from data, and there are many examples of of successes in the last decade. Some some of them truly is spectacular. And a lot of these things, these machine learning methods has been transferred then to, to research with biomedical applications. Some, some very, some very early examples are, uh, by, by some of the big companies are listed here. Uh, for example, when Google had the, had the big study on, on classification of images of the retina, uh, or, or there are other examples by, other big companies, I mean, that there are now hundreds or thousands of them. Uh, this, these were maybe the first ones. Now, all these examples have something in common. They're examples of course of, of the task number two. They are all examples of prediction. Because they are all these, these are all examples that map input to output. They're not examples of counterfactual prediction. They are not examples of causal inference. There is nothing causal about those things. And that's because they don't consider the world under different courses of action. Well, this um, may sound an academic distinction at this point for some of you, but I'm going to try to argue that it's a very important distinction because it has a deep, in, they have deep implications, not only for how we use the data, but how we interpret what we get and also how useful for decision-making is it. See, we talk about this task number two, we talk about, prediction, this is a natural uh, application of current machine learning methods, because if you think about that, you can, you, you could argue, you could argue that to be successful, you need only three things. You need lots of data, you need a very good algorithm, and you need a metric to assess how good the performance of the mapping is. And that means that in principle, this task can be automated without we can we can do very good mappings without human intervention so let's talk about the role of human intervention here okay because this is this is really uh, a very important message of this talk we talk about counterfactual prediction about causal inference we clearly see that we need we need domain specific knowledge about the causal structure. And I go into more detail about why we need this. But if we don't have causal knowledge, we don't have extra knowledge, we, we cannot ask good causal questions and we cannot answer good causal questions using the data. Whereas for prediction, one might ar argue that we don't need so much domain specific knowledge about the causal structure. We have a well-defined yeah, um, if we know the mapping that we want to do, and we have good data, and we have a good learning algorithm, that's it. 
And this, this has led to this way of thinking that is still very prevalent in some circles that is essentially saying, give me lots of data and I'll answer all your questions because I know how to do it. I have the algorithms. Uh, I'm going to, I'm going to claim that that is, that that is a problem. And I, it's, it is a misunderstanding. Doesn't matter how much data you have, there are some questions that we are not going to be able to answer with data on it. So if you think about, about this definition that I show you of artificial intelligence on Wikipedia, this is the part that I read aloud before. But the, then it follows and it says, specifically AI is the ability of computing algorithms to approximate conclusions based solely on input data. This is not possible right now for causal inference. So we cannot make a inference based on data only. Uh, so under this definition, what we now refer to as AI cannot possibly make causal inference. Now, let me explain what I mean here. I'm going to give you two examples um, of causal questions for which we, we need extra knowledge. Well, first example is when, when, um, when we need to know whether there is sufficient information to adjust for confounding. And the second example is when we realize that um, when, when we have enough knowledge to, to determine that the variables that are being adjusted for are they are, are not correct and are increasing bias. The first example is screening for colorectal cancer. The second example is maternal smoking and, and infant mortality. And these are two examples that are chosen because this task is trivial for a human expert, but is beyond the abilities of current AI systems, machine learning systems. So in the first e example, let's say that we, we want to know whether um, a screening, col a screening colonoscopy prevent or cause mortality. And we have lots of data. Let's say that we have um, millions of people on Medicare. We have their entire medical history, all their claims, and uh, and we also have very good machine learning algorithms to to find uh, variables that are associated with the both with the screening and with the and with the outcome with that, and we are going to adjust for all of all those variables, and we have computers that are very good. So we can we can do it in a reasonable amount of time. And here we can use, uh, think of the most complex um, deep learning algorithm or anything else that you have in mind, okay? So if you do that, if you just say lots of, lots of data on millions of people in the US with, with billions of claims, and the best machine learning algorithm that you that you can think of, and a very powerful computer, we are not going to get the right answer. It's just not possible by having all those three things. Now, how how do we know that we're not getting the right answer? Because if we look at the at the difference, this is after doing that, which we did. After doing that, if um, if you look at the difference in mortality risk after eight years. It's of six percentage points between people who get screening and people who don't get screening. We we know that that is wrong. That's absolutely wrong because we are screening for colorectal cancer and only about two two percent of people die from colorectal cancer. So even if every even if every single cancer were prevented by screening, which is not possible, but even in that extreme case. What we are finding is beyond the possibility of a screen. So this is not a causal estimate. I mean, this is a wrong causal estimate, but the algorithm has no way of knowing it. Any human expert looking at this says, oh, this is not working. What is going on here? That we don't have enough information in the database. This, despite having billions of claims, we don't have data on, on health behaviors, on physical activity, on health consumers, uh, on cigarette, is smoking, and without these variables, we cannot adjust for confounding. People who get a screening, people who don't get a screening are fundamentally different types of people. And there is no clever algorithm that is going to eliminate that uh, essential non-comparability that we have. Doesn't matter how much data we have. 
doesn't matter how powerful our computer is and doesn't matter how good the mapping that we can do from inputs to output is. So in the second example that I was going to, to show you, um, let's say that uh, we, we, are, we are looking at our cigarette smoking during, during pregnancy affects uh, the risk of infant mortality. And we know that pregnant women who do and do not smoke differ in many characteristics that affect the risk of infant mortality. So we need to adjust for all those things. Okay, let's say that we have all those things in the data and we can adjust for all those things. So this is so this example is different from the previous one. Here we do have all the information. We could get it right. Um, and what are the variables that we need to adjust for? We need to adjust for compounders, variables that are associated both with the with a treatment of interest, so with an exposure of interest, which in this case is maternal smoking, and with the outcome of interest, which is infant mortality. The problem is that there are many variables that are asso associated with the exposure and the outcome and are not co-founders. They are, as we know them, colliders. These variables are statistically indistinguishable from confounders. But if we adjust for them, we will introduce bias. One, one example of this is birth is birth weight. Birth weight cannot possibly um, cannot possibly affect um, cannot possibly be a confounder here because it happens after maternal smoking. And uh, and if we adjust for for that variable, we will we we will get bias. The question is how can any existing machine learning algorithm know that? Because if we adjust for that variable, we could get bias. This actually has been known in the literature for decades as the birth weight paradox, which is the bias that you get when, uh, when you are adjusting for birth weight in pregnancy studies, which is very well understood by humans now because we know what's the causal structure. We can represent that using a causal graph in which we have cigarette smoking a uh, y is infant mortality, C is low birth weight. We see that uh, both the variable that we are trying to estimate the effect of and other unmeasured factors, U, affect birth weight. So if that, that is a collider on the causal graph. We can have a reason. We, we, can, we, can, we can causally reason about why adjusting for C, we create bias. Here, I'm giving you an example in which C happens after A but there are other examples in which it is before A. So we cannot fix this by simply looking at the time signature of A and C. So, that's, um, so that is the problem, that, that if we use a machine learning algorithm that uses only the data that we have, uh, we, can, um, we can have the wrong causal estimates. And either because it missed features that should be adjusted for, but they're not in the database. And any human would know that, any, any, any expert would know that, would say, hey, I cannot do this because there are all these confounders that are not in the database, I cannot do it. Or it's using features that are in the database and should not be adjusted for, and any human expert would know that. Uh, these are very simple examples, just, just to convey the point that data only is not sufficient for causal inference. Um, unless they, we are in some weird setting in which there are, there are no unmeasured compounders, there are, there are no colliders, there are, there are no instruments. Also, if we adjust for instruments, we will get bias, of course. And that, and that is why data analysis competitions, machine learning competitions are great for a prediction for task number two, but not so great for causal inference for task uh, number three because uh, you, cannot, um, you cannot do this with data only. And even, and even worse, when we do it with data, we don't have a metric to know how well we are doing as we have for a prediction only. This is a, this is a, this is a commentary that I wrote about this um, a, couple of, a couple of years ago. So, because when, when we are using um, data only and we, organize a causal inference competition, we have to over simplify things uh, in order for machine learning algorithms to, to have the guarantee that they're going to give the right answer, which is like the, 
like the like the old joke about the farmer who has the local university for assistance to increase the milk production of his cows. And someone came back and say, I have the solution, but it works only in the case of a spherical cow in a vacuum. Right? That's kind of what we are uh, saying. If we want to use data on this, um, I mean, machine learning or causal inference. So um, this is this is a this is a common source of confusion, and this failure to understand the role of subject matter knowledge of domain knowledge uh, for task number two and for task number three has has um, has led to um, uh, to lots of misunderstanding. So. Essentially, this thing of give me tons of data and I answer all your questions because I have great algorithms and great computers. Well, doesn't work for cost of questions generally. So this is something that is not, it's not new. Uh, this has been known for decades. I mean, you think about people have been working with healthcare data, databases since the 70s. Um, we have used biobanks and other large uh, observational databases since the 50s. And even some of the things that are now known as machine learning have been used for, for, a, very, for, a, for a very long time. So nothing really new, but the difference is that lots of people have come into healthcare in the last 10 or 20 years who may not know the history of the research here. And, and uh, what is happening is that a lot of things have, have been reinvented now. But that doesn't mean that there are not new things. There are some, there are some new things. One is that we have much better computers. So things that were impossible to do in the 70s, the 80s, and the 90s, we can do them now very quickly. And that is um, that is great. The other thing is that there is massive financial support to do these things now um, and to develop this algorithm that didn't exist. Before and the third thing, of course, is that we have sexier words for many of the things that um, in the past we were saying things like fitting, and now we are saying learning or all things. <clears throat> but it is it is very important that we connect with all these literature from the past because a lot of recent work in machine learning, uh, especially for causal inference is rediscovering well-known facts. Uh, I, I was uh, a couple of years ago in a big machine learning conference where the main um, conclusion from a very important person at Google was that, hey, we have found that healthcare data are complicated and messy, that getting high quality data is important and that we have to do deep phenotyping, which for anyone who has been working with large databases for the last few decades is like, duh, yes. Exactly. That is the problem. The problem is not the algorithms. The problem is the the the, the data and the and the and the subject matter knowledge that we need to use the data for that. So why why this why this why this confusion? Well, this confusion is in part because machine learning actually works very well for causal inference in some simple settings. And that has extrapolated to healthcare. And you think about settings in which we know the laws that govern a system. We have perfect information and we can do an arbitrary large number of experiments. Then machine learning works fine for causal inference. And of course, uh, the example could, couldn't be otherwise is go and games. This is an example in which we know the rules, we know the rules of the game. We have perfect information at any time because we, we have the current board position of uh, all the pieces. And because of reinforcement learning, we can simulate an arbitrary large number of experiments. Doing that, we can ask Koha questions about which move should I do now? And machine learning has been spectacularly successful. Unfortunately, health questions are not like that. We don't know the rules of the game. We, we, it's, too, it's too complex. We cannot simulate it uh, well. We don't have perfect information, not even close. And of course, we, can do multi, we cannot do multiple experiments because we cannot simulate it um, well enough. So that is um, 
that is the problem that in these simple settings, we don't need to make a distinction really between task number two and task number three. They are the same. We can use the root counterfactual prediction just by doing factual mapping of inputs to output. But um, there is a gradient here. As we move away from games that go, we want to self-driving cars. Things get a little bit more complicated. Still, we know a lot of the rules of the games because it's based on the physical laws. I mean, we have enough sensors. We may get a lot of the information that we need. But and you get in things like the human body and the society and say that uh, this breaks up. So that is why I said at the start that the factual prediction needs uh, domain knowledge, a lot of causal structure, in a sense that pure pure mapping of inputs to inputs does it. But that uh, is this, I want to finish with this point, even for mapping of inputs to outputs, we also need causal knowledge. We need less causal knowledge, but we need it because if we had a causally, a, a causally blind machine learning algorithm, we can be very, we can create a very good mapping in a setting that is not, ex, is, that cannot be used in the settings where we want to deploy. And this is the problem of shortcut learning, right? With the algorithm lens to associate some features with the target that we want to predict, but those features don't exist in the deployment settings. Why? Because they're not part of the causal structure that we're interested in. And the, and the most typical example recently is when, um, when we use deep learning to create a clinical decision support tool to um, look at look at chest x-rays and determine who has COVID. When we are doing this, we are expecting that the algorithm will learn things about the pathology, about the disease that is shown in the x-rays and that will help us predict. But what may happen is that what the algorithms see are, are the pixels that correspond to the watermark of a particular hospital where most COVID patients go and say, oh, so is it is it is very likely that this chest x-ray comes um from a COVID patient because I'm looking at the identification of the hospital, not at the so the way to think about about shortcut learning is by going back to the causal structure. We need causal inference. For example, we can say there are three types of features, the features like uh lung opacity and other characteristics of the disease that we're going to find also in the deployment settings. Features like the watermark that are in the training setting but not in the deployment setting. And then other features that are really not associated with anything like a number of ribs here. So the third type of feature is fine. Machine learning will exclude that. But to, to exclude the second type of feature, the shortcut feature, we need custom knowledge and we need to intervene to restrict the set of inputs that we're giving to the algorithm. So this is also very important also because a premise of machine learning is that it can help uh, make better decisions. But think about that. With task number three, yes, we are helping to make better decisions. We are telling you doing A is better than doing B. But with task number two, it's a much weaker way of helping decisions. Because we are telling you, look, this patient is at a very high risk. I don't tell you what to do. I'm not telling. I'm not helping you make a decision. I'm telling you that the decision needs to be made. So that's why when we talk about decision making and machine learning, how to help, we are really talking about causal inference, about counterfactual prediction, not about mapping inputs to outputs. And um, um, I'm going to finish here. So if we want a machine learning that can be, can learn not only for description and for mappings from input to output, but also can move into causal inference, then we need to, we need to get serious about the development of methods for the integration of domain expertise and data in ways that computers can understand it. And we need to, uh, to be very clear about the fact that we cannot make causal inferences right now uh, in a purely data-driven way because the, the 
because causal inference, as we have it now, has to combine data with expert uh, causal knowledge. And this is my last slide here. Someone said that the essence of intelligence is the ability to predict. Well, that's not accurate enough. The essence of intelligence is the ability to predict counterfactually how the world would change under different actions. And that is really where we uh, where we are where we are going with with machine learning. We are extending it to task number three to cause an interest. Thank you very much.